It's time for another Dice Tower review from Gamer's Remorse. Hello and welcome back to Gamer's Remorse. Today we're taking a look at the game Caverna by Mayfair, a U Rosenberg game. Uh, we're going to do something a little bit different on this review. Usually we go through at least a, a high-level overview of how to play the game. Uh, we hit most of the rules. If you're familiar with U Rosenberg games, it's a bit massive of an undertaking to try and explain his game in the course of five minutes because we need the other ten to review. And so instead we're going to recommend that you go and watch uh, Tom Vassell did an excellent overview of it. We don't even want to try to repeat uh, yeah. that <laughs> just because we would like the time to review it. All in all, it looks beautiful. Um, if you've played some of the earlier games and I don't want to say the series, because I don't know if technically this is in the same series as Agricola, but there were cubes and discs, um, and now we have deeples, whatever you call a donkey meeple. We have sheeples, we have weeples, <laughs> reeples, keeples, weeples. I mean, we have everything meepleified, which is fantastic. It would be cool if there were some different colorizations. We kept mixing up wood and cows, uh, putting them in the wrong trays and everything, which was kind of uh, frustrating. Um, but it looks gorgeous. The tiles are amazing. So the art and everything is fantastic other than that. Um, but I do wish that some of the meeples were e more easily distinguishable. Um, I was really hoping that they're going to be dwarf meeples because um, I thought that would be, just be fantastic and awesome and it would represent my people. Um, but unfortunately, we just had the discs. So all in all, I give it one and a half out of two. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's a it's a Euro game, right? And Euro games tend to be a bit more recessive in regards to graphics, right? Mm -hmm. They try and minimalize everything as much as possible because there's so much going on. And so you can't have... Uh, for lack of a better word, fantasy flight in your face graphics. Yeah. I personally, I don't think I would change anything, so I gave it a two. But, but, let's meet right. in the middle, 175. All right, we'll say 175. But again, if, you, if, you've, if you're a big fan of Agricola, Caverna is the obvious and logical next step. Yeah. It is the spiritual successor to Agricola, I would go ahead like, and it's, say. I, I'm not even going to say it's a child or relative. It is Agricola seven years after high school. He's hit the gym. He's refined himself. <laughs> right. He's grown a little bit. Got a better haircut. <laughs> He's looking to settle down. Changed his name to Caverna. I mean, yeah, it's reasonable. <laughs> he stopped talking to that really nasty ex. The, you know. Anyway, <laughs> balance and mechanics. In regards to that, again, I gave it full marks on that. I'd give it two out of two because. I mean, it's a U Rosenberg game, and it's already well built. It's well done. The uh, the engine is there already. It was just how he dressed it up. Instead of just focusing on the agricultural side to it, he went into kind of a dwarven mythos, I would say, in regards to expanding inside a mountain. You're digging into this mountain. You're building all of these different chambers. You need to build so many chambers in order to uh, facilitate the dwarves you're collecting or adding into your family and then different rooms get you different bonuses as a player it splits your attention between two different areas and it was really interesting to see people play that because Brian and I both fixated on the internal dwarven mind thing because eh, why would I want to farm I'm not really yeah. into it. I mean we live in Iowa but whatever <laughs> not not into it so we were both like oh sweet I can get an ore mine get a ruby mine on top of that get a treasure chamber uh, meanwhile, my wife is over here like, oh, I'm building a farm, I've got some sheep, I've got some donkeys, it's fun. And then we kind of flip-flopped in the middle because yeah. we realized, oh no, we need to, you know, change up the balance. So overall, I gave it full marks on that just because it's already a great game. He improved on what was the original concept. I don't see why I would market any demerits for that. Um. I thought it was fairly well balanced. It boasts a record-breaking 262 playtesters, if I remember correctly. <laughs> so it's very well polished. Um, and there are some issues that were in just the book of the rulebook um, that 
took some adapting to and so it kind of imbalanced it in that learning side of things. But then there were other aspects and I may be biased because I didn't cash in on them well early on. Um, <laughs> but I feel, for example, the rubies are moderately overpowered and that you can just be like, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do this. So like on the last round, I just took three turns back to back and pretty much wrecked anyone's possible plans. So I think there should be some limitations in that. Like you can't do Ruby, 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 unless you're the Beatles. <laughs> Is that the Beatles? Ooh, Ruby, 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 Ruby. Is it the Stones? I don't know. Whatever band sang that. Uh, but, but I felt like those were kind of overpowered to a degree. Maybe that's just my bias. Well, I would argue- getting to them earlier. I would argue that at the same time, you're spending your victory points to do that. And so you could arguably say that you did yourself somewhat a disservice. Except I traded in one ruby to get four victory points and an extra ruby, which I spent to get four more victory points and an extra ruby. Potentially you could have been able to do those extra victory points anyway, because I wasn't gonna pick up all the extra mm -hmm. ore. I, I had no interest in that, neither did Leah. So, I mean, there's it's a little bit of a balancing yeah. game there. You could do that, you could chain ruby but the, like I was saying, like I was able to use them to that regard, but you could mm -hmm. use them to steal both children. Um, so in one turn, the player goes first. <laughs> that sounded wrong. Yeah. Um, the person who goes first, if they have rubies saved up, they can be like, boom, uh, urgent wish for children. Boom, family life. Oh, you guys don't get... But, I mean, it's a checks and balances game, right? Because then you have to pay for the food for those people. Odds are, if you're spending all your time getting rubies and then having children, you probably don't have the food to back that up. Unless your previous three turns were mass farming. True, but then you're I not think, spending a lot of time expanding. I think I could play this game, and by the end of the third age, have all five of my people in play and not have to worry about feeding them. I completely agree. Because of the rubies. I disagree. <laughs> There's a lot of micro decisions you're making in this game, mm -hmm. and that's one of the parts of this, is it's checks and balances, right? Yeah, you're spending rubies to go, my turn, my turn, my turn. And I did that several times until I realized it's kind of a false friend. Mm -hmm. Because had I not spent those rubies, I would have easily had another 30 points at the end of the game. One step for that. Okay, all right. All right, all right so, pacing. Yeah. I mean, there's a massive learning curve on this game. There's going to be when there's so many moving components, and it's it's a fiddly game, for lack of a better word. There's a lot of pieces here. Better word? It's a Rosenberg. <laughs> it's a Rosenberg game. So, I mean, what'll happen is at the end of the round, it's like, okay, we need to fill up all the components. Okay, we need to feed our people. Okay, there's breeding happening. We're harvesting. I mean, there's just a lot of piece manipulation mm -hmm. that's happening. Uh, beyond that, though, there are, one could argue, what is that, 18 different options? Yeah. No, nine times three, 27 different options. And then when you dig down into those options, there's usually three to five options mm -hmm. beyond that. Yeah. It just adds up. And so, I mean, AP players are going to slow it down. Yeah. The more players that you're going to have are going to slow it down. Um, it's just something to be aware of. Yeah. I would agree, 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5? Yeah. So theme, what are your thoughts? Um, so it's a Euro game, uh, which theme usually, it, it's not like an Ameritrash game where it walks up and slaps you in the face. It's more subtle than that. Mm -hmm. But I will say this is a Euro game that did well to merge the theme in. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I did feel like a dwarf to a degree, you know, mining out this tunnel. I was making these little tunnels, these little paths all over, and then building specific uh, chambers, if you will, into my mountain that then I could use to help either get me more gold, get me more points, um, do various things. I actually, I gave it full points, but it's a very hazy full points because I gave it the benefit of the doubt because it's a Euro. As you guys, if you have watched most of our videos are well aware, I love me some theme. <laughs> uh, as you also may tell, I guess you don't know because you don't get to see me standing up much. I am essentially a dwarf. I'm short. I have an awesome beard. I'm a dwarf. What can I say? Um, so I was really excited for this game, um, but I didn't feel a whole lot like a dwarf per se. 
Kind of like you were saying, like dwarves stereotypically aren't known for their farming. Uh, I can think of one mythos where they have amazing gardens, that being one of my favorite series, Shannara, look it up. Um, but other than that, like I'm just sitting here like, why would my dwarves be farming? So I just ignored <laughs> farming because I wanted to enjoy the theme of being a dwarf. And you can't be a dwarf in this game and win it. <laughs> um, you have to also have farming. Oh, I learned that the hard way. Uh, but that being said, like I think it's because it had a theme, I found it a lot more enjoyable than games such as Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, so how about 175? You're already hazy. All right, easy to learn. What do you think? <laughs> Exhibit A, legal size rule book, 24 pages. Appendix. Usually appendixes aren't necessary in people or rules. This is not the case. Uh, the rules were daunting. And I mean, like you spend a good 30 minutes setting it up the first time. So I mean, the, the ease to learn and set up is combined quite difficult. I only would give it a 0.5 for that. Mm -hmm. If you're going to get this game, get some form of storage. Uh, if you have baggies, it would be terrible. Uh, fortunately, we have these awesome compartments from the Broken Token. They're fantastic. Um, mm. Yeah. Like, mm. <laughs> mm. I would not want to teach this to someone new to the Euro game world. Um, I wouldn't want to teach this to an analysis paralysis gamer. And I don't think I'd want to teach this to a gamer who likes to be on their phone during gameplay. All true points. Counterpoint, though. Mm -hmm. Once you learn it, you pretty well know it. Mm -hmm. You know? It's, it's got that same Rosenberg feel to it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, it's... You have these options. Place your disc out there. Perform the action. So, what'd you give it? 0.5? I'm thinking 0.5. 0.5? All right. I'd buy it. All right. <laughs> uh, replayability. I think every time you would play it, it's going to be different. Mm -hmm. Because the options are going to be different. Uh, other players' decisions are going to change how you play the game. I will say I would have preferred a little bit more interaction between mm -hmm. players. Maybe you can trade cattle. Maybe you can, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I need food, you want, or let's do a trade. Um, but I will say it seems to be a little bit less stovepiped than Agricola. Um, but not a whole lot. It still seems to be that everyone's playing solitaire and it's just a matter of what houses are out there. Mm -hmm. 1.5 out of two is what I would say. What'd you think? Yeah, I thought the replayability is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's one of those games where like you learn and get a better strategy on every single gameplay, but because you're playing against other people who are learning as well, like that skill cap just keeps rising, which is fantastic. But I think there's this aspect of it's very replayable in the right group. I have some friends who I know we could play this back to back to back to back and have a blast. I know other friends who would get halfway through and rage quit. Um, yeah. So I mean, you need if you're playing with people who love Euros, they will love this game and they will want to play it over and over. Um, mm -hmm. So would you agree? One point. I would agree. One point five. Seven point seven five for Caverna on Gamer's Remorse. Um, I I would highly recommend it. I think it's a great game. Um, it's a little bit more of a spendy game, which leads us to our final topic. Is it worth the price? So it's $97, so it's more towards the expensive end of things, but there's a lot of components going on here. Um, I would recommend the game uh, as a solid Euro. Uh, the price is a little bit up there, and then if you get you know, some of the extra uh, organizers and whatnot, that's something to factor in as well. I would say if you love you Rosenberg games, this is a must buy. If you are a hobby gamer who just wants a good Euro game, worker placement Euro game, I would probably go with a less expensive worker placement game that I would get just as much play out of. Yeah, I think the hard pill to swallow is the cost, but there are so many components, I think it justifies the cost. Um, and instead of little cubes, it's specifically cut out pieces. Except the dwarves. If they had dwarf <laughs> meeples, 
I would pay, I think you can, I would sell my car for this game. I think you can upgrade your games based upon aftermarket pieces. No, I've seen that all the time. You know what I, I mean? Dwarf Meeple. Yeah. I, I will I'm use them for every game. I'm 98% sure that I'm, that's a thing. If there are Dwarf Meeples, somebody sent them to me for Christmas. <laughs> Maybe your board game geek secret Santa will. It's a thing. <laughs> anyway, I think it's worth the money. Brian pinches his pennies a little more, on he's on the fence, so we're gonna give it a... Yeah? <laughs> Question mark? <laughs> I would say it's worth it. So, anyway, if this interests you, go ahead and check it out. Um, I think just about every store anywhere has it, so. All right, thanks guys. I just realized something. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna throw this out there. You Rosenberg. You row Zenberg. You row. Euro game. You row. Zenberg. Oh! Wow! Oh. Technically, I think it's Uve, because no! Warren. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top rated audio podcast at dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.